Um, so uh, I am Audrey Hendricks, and, and we are absolutely delighted to share what we think is a very important and um, interesting uh, topic with you. And so we will go ahead and get started. But first, thank you all for being here on a Wednesday morning. I appreciate it. Last day of the conference. Yeah. Our first speaker today is going to be uh, Mariah So. Mariah So is a demand cartographer and GIS specialist for UCLA's Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies. Mariah received her master's degree in geographic information systems from the University of Redlands and her bachelor of arts in environment economics and politics from Scripps College. Her research interests include critical data, critics cartography, indigenous methodologies, and interdisciplinary storytelling. So welcome, Mariah. Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a little soft spoken, so if you can't hear me, let me know and I can try to. I don't know if this is on, maybe. We can turn it on. Perfect. Hopefully, that's a little bit better for folks. Um, so, today I'll be talking about a couple of frameworks and resources that I use to help answer the question of, you know, what is race proxy for? But before we get into that question, I have a little bit of foundational uh, tools to lay down first. Does anyone see the mouse? It's there. Is it not clicking through? The arrow keys don't seem to want to go through my slides. So I'm just trying to find. Oh. The mouse. Oh, perhaps that did it. Well, the question I usually start with is what is data? So that's usually the basic question that I'll start off when um, I get to teach on occasion, which I know is pretty basic, but it's very important. And so we're all data scientists here. So we usually know that this refers to stored information or proxy for the real world. And as a GIS specialist, uh, maps are often one of my favorite types of data visualizations. And a typical definition for a map is that it's data plus location. So if that's the case, I usually like to test this and ask my students or the audience here today, if uh, that's the case, which one of these items is a map or geographic information system? A, B through F. Anyone have any guesses? It's not graded. I'm not going to remember this. <laughs> Very low stakes. They are all maps. So oftentimes it's only see the so-called world uh, political map that is recognized as the sole map. But why? All of these are clearly ordered. There's a system to them. They have information. They have spatial knowledge, whether it's how to navigate through areas during the Jim Crow area. The second one, B, is a map. Um, for sea navigation, it's for coastlines, which means it can float and also be read in the dark. D is a um, dot drawing from the indigenous folks of so-called Australia. So it tells stories across the locational and spiritual planes. E is a map for sea navigation from the so-called um, Marshall Islands, the indigenous peoples up there. And F is my personal favorite, that is Cisna on how to find um, patches of flowers. Well, wait a minute, what exactly has a uh, scientific truth meant, historically speaking? So here I'll usually talk about this concept of the scientific male gaze, which starts with this idea of a disembodied scientist. This so-called disembodiment produces unbiased knowledge, and this process is linked to power and the location of the observer. So this is the power of the gaze, the power to look. And from a Eurocentric historical standpoint, the power usually lies with heterosexual white men. So modern science rooted in these Western or Eurocentric traditions positions the single gaze as universal and objective. By contrast, this positions other ways of knowing and the positions of other observers as non-objective, irrational, and partial. So this effectively disempowers the gazes of women, colonial subjects, elderly children, sexual minorities, and so on. And this creates a clear divide between those who have power to make claims to truth, authority, and power. This establishes a hierarchy where certain types of knowledges and points of view have more value than others. In Western culture, this is often based on binaries and dichotomies such as 
scientific, non-scientific, masculine and feminine, active, passive, objective, subjective, and so on. Perhaps qualitative and quantitative. What about human, non-human? So thinking back to the quiz, why is it that traditionally speaking only see the quote world political map is viewed as a map? Why are other systems of knowledge relegated to spheres such as mythology, folklore, fol folklore, folk art, not even fine art, artifact or craft instead of technology and science? How does that determine which knowledge systems or gazes hold authority? And why are humans the only ones who have maps or technologies? And what are the consequences of viewing something from just one universal perspective? So this is usually how I'll start out um, and then start asking, what kind of assumptions do we make about data? Does the data actually speak for itself? The question is no. Um, critical data studies asserts that data is alive, never raw, but always cooked inherently tied to the technological, political, and economic infrastructures that sustain it. So data in, are informed by specific histories, ideologies, and philosophies that tend to remain hidden. Simply put, data are power. To view data as neutral, objective, or apolitical risks reproducing structural inequalities present in our current systems. And data's rhetorical power lies in the power to describe and as a basis for action. So what's your literacy in this type of data power analysis? And no, I'm not talking about, you know, the ability to measure change. I'm talking about the ways in which data you work with are generated, curated, and how they permeate and exert power on life. A quote from a book I'll soon reference says, counting and classification can be powerful parts of the process of creating knowledge, but they are also tools of power in themselves. Historically, counting and classification have been used to dominate, discipline, and exclude. So ultimately, how we choose to count, classify, and code reflects back our own values and biases, a reflective meaning-making process and practice. Shortly put, simply put, we measure what we value. So what does this mean for racial data? How might the assumption that these categories are objective or even simply just the way things are elevate some viewpoints over others? Embedded in these categories are narratives about how we order and prioritize life. So how do we as researchers, scientists, analysts wield that power? How does this power impact who lives and who dies? It is said that quantification is a technology of distance, calling back to the concept of the scientific male gaze, which relies on distance between the observer and the observed as a basis to activity. Who benefits from this distance? Who is harmed? After all, Georgia Lupi's data humanism piece asserts data isn't just numbers, data is people. So the mystery quote from the mirror slide is from Data Feminism by Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren F. Klein. The framework and stories outlined in this book push back against the narratives around big data and data science that are overwhelmingly white, male, and techno-heroic. At its core, it means asking questions like data science by whom, data science for whom, and data science with whose interests in mind. And so there's seven principles of data feminism that are uh, outlined throughout the entire book. So some of these are themes that I've already mentioned, like rethink binaries and hierarchies and consider context. It includes not just examining and analyzing power, but also actively challenging those structures to work towards justice. Next is elevating emotion and embodiment by valuing multiple forms of knowledge, including knowledge that comes from people as living, feeling bodies in the world. Another principle is to embrace and th synthesize multiple perspectives and giving priority to local, indigenous, and experiential ways of knowing. And last is make labor visible. It is important to recognize that data science is the work of many hands. One of my favorite poets, Billy Ray Belcourt, says, we live in a society obsessed with proof and we live in a society obsessed with forgetting. Who bears the burden of proof? Some of the questions posed in data feminism say, who is it exactly that needs to be shown the harms of differentials of power? What kind of proof do they require to believe that oppression is real? 
What harm gets reproduced in narratives that only document deficits and differences and reduce communities to their problems? And how might proof unwittingly compound those harmful narratives? We talk a lot about big data, but what about small data? Did you know that I come from an asterisk nation? American Indians and Alaska Natives may be described as the asterisk nation because an asterisk instead of a data point is often used in data displays when reporting racial and ethnic data due to various data collection and reporting issues, such as small sample size, large margins of error, or other issues related to validity and statistical significance. A lack of data is also an indication of power. And when it comes to racial and ethnic data, what happens when you come from small data? When you're in a situation where proof or evidence is required uh, to validate your life experience, but there is no data that exists for that. It is no exaggeration to say that board, poor data collection and representation for indigenous peoples is data genocide. To be counted often translates to access to resources and rights. So when we work with that data, that what do we value and who do we value? Next is complexity. Apologies for the font difference on this. I know it's very difficult to read. Something that often comes hand in hand with simplification is cleaning. So there are these assumptions that data are inherently messy and need to be tidied and tamed. And there's also an assumption that all data scientists in all contexts value cleanliness and control over messiness and complexity. Again, data feminism prompts us to ask, what might be lost in the process of dominating and disciplining data? Whose perspectives might be lost in that process? And conversely, whose perspectives might be additionally imposed? Now here, I had a video, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to work just with the internet speeds. But the video uh, clip is from a TED talk called Why Indigenous People Want You to Stop Labeling Them as Latino by Odelia Romero, who is a Zapotec woman and is the um, one of the leaders of Cielo, which is a community-based organization in LA. And so one of the some of the things that she talks about is the dangers of Latinidad. And that there is this assumption that everyone south from the imposed border speaks Spanish, but that's very much not true. And so she asserts that she is not Latina, she's not Hispanic, not Mexican, she's Zapotec, she's Benehosho. And that in this way, labeling is dangerous. You cannot fix our 500 years of resistance as indigenous peoples into one box. You cannot fit hundreds of indigenous languages within box, hundreds of worldviews, hundreds of ways of saying I love you, hundreds of ways of resisting. So this next portion, I ask, how did data conventions confine what we think of as possible? If one of the rhetorical powers of data is action, then how do our imagined futures are influenced by our methods? So talking about race and ethnicity as a variable, it's a classification, it's a way of grouping people. Critical race theory tells us that race is a social construct, it's not biological, meaning it's temporal, it's ar arguably time and place specific. So in thinking about um, the people that I'm from, I'm classified as American Indian or Alaska Native, that means asking the question, how did Indigenous peoples become racialized, specifically in the United States? It's also a key reminder here that it's not just a racial identity, it is a political identity. Um, you know, make sure to look at the recent ICWA ruling to really um, get an idea of what that means. And also, it also has is deeply connected to land. So the long answer in this is um, there's a piece called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, so I highly recommend reading that. This is the very shortened version of this. Um, but to understand how Indigenous peoples are racialized in terms of land, you have to look at the racial technologies of blood quantum. So blood quantum is fractions of ancestry. I have a certificate of Indian blood. It lists me as one half quantile of Navajo blood. Um, and if you've ever played with fractions, you'll know that without a whole or a full blood in this case, they are easy to shrink. And that's the idea behind blood quantum. It is subtractive. So when decolonization is not a metaphor, the author summarized that Native Americans are constructed to become fewer in number and less Native, but not exactly white over time. 
Our status as indigenous peoples first inhabitants is the basis of our land claims and the goal of settler colonialism is to diminish claims to land over generations or sooner if possible. That is Native American or is a racialization that portrays contemporary indigenous generations to be less authentic, less indigenous than every prior generation in order to ultimately phase out indigenous claims to land and usher in settler claims to property. So extra credit, make sure you look up the Half-Breed Tracts and Dawes Act or General Allotment Act of 1886 or 1887. This will tell you more historically how those have played out politically. And so in short, race codes a particular relationship to land. So if data is proxy in the real world, what exactly is race proxy for? So let's talk verbs meaning let's talk the basis for action and data. And so for this, let's look at COVID-19 in particular, and specifically the racial disparities and deaths from COVID-19. We know that certain underlying conditions or comorbidities uh, contribute greatly to the vulnerability of certain populations to severe COVID cases. And understanding the prevalence of these underlying conditions in native communities requires some digging. So if you look at diabetes in the Navajo Nation, for instance, the first documented case was on in 1937 in a survey of one in 6,000. Today, it runs a lot higher. It's one in four, in some cases, as high as one in two. The Sparks Note edition of the story of diabetes in Navajo is that it is a nutrition-related disease, and this diabetes is inherently a colonial disease. Um, in that it is very important to understand that the present day prevalence, you have to look at the history of scorched earth campaigns, the forced deportation march known as the long walk, the origin of fry bread, not simply as a cultural food, but as a survival story born from insufficient food rations, the flood of government sp sponsored commodity food programs, and one must trace the web-like connections between extractive energy practices like oil and coal, the Livestock Reduction Act, the impact of rug weaving um, and Diné women's economic and social autonomy, and the coercion into the wage labor market. So this is a very extensive historical background where it identifies the root of the issue as settler colonialism. The disease is settler colonialism. So based on this type of framework, the intervention shift, not just from being individual based, but from being structural community and land based. So simply eating fruits and vegetables or even individual level medical plans are not going to um, be a decolonizing act, but reclaiming traditional diets and rejecting westernized industrial food is what decolonizes food systems by reclaiming relationships to land. And this is food sovereignty. It means revitalizing traditional food systems that are essential to the health of native communities by reclaiming cultural memory, identity, language, and sovereignty. In this way, land back is a public health intervention and not just any public intervention, but arguably the most effective and encompassing option. Another question from data feminism is what if producing new social relationships, increasing community solidarity, and enhancing social cohesion was valued and funded as much as acquiring data. This book also distinguishes data ethics from data justice by stating that concepts like ethics, bias, fairness, accountability, transparency, and understanding algorithms secure power because they locate the source of the problem in individuals or technical systems whereas concepts like justice, oppression, equity, co-liberation, reflexivity, and understanding history, culture, and context challenge power because they acknowledge structural power differentials and work towards dismantling them. So not instead of accountability, but in addition to, co-liberation means free the data, doesn't mean free the data, but rather means free the people. In addition to transparency, there is also a need for reflexivity, which is the ability to reflect on and take responsibility for one's own position within the multiple and intersecting dimensions of oppressive forces. I love this framework because it challenges us to think outside of solutions such as more data or better data to address data inequities. And to think about the ways oppression historically and ongoing presents itself in our lives and also in our data. So full transparency, 
something that can cause harm is aggregation of um, different racial groups. And it's something that we have done in our work at MDH before. And so something that we have done is we've aggregated particularly American Indian and Alaska Native people as all others are all other races. This also had a compounded invisibility effect for other Asian American folks, Pacific Islanders. And on reflecting on the impact of this kind of aggregation that can reproduce kinds of harmful invisibility, our dashboards no longer aggregate these groups as all other races were possible. So sometimes I think it's easy to forget that we all make mistakes, that we all do harm. What matters is how we respond to it and the types of relationships we have in place to do so. A reminder that examining and challenging power is not something that we can do by ourselves. I appreciate this framework of data ethics to data justice because it also helps me reflect and navigate particular tension points uh, that appear when working with the arrest data that I frequently work with. So the racial and ethnic category are officer identified, they're not self-identified, which means many people are miscategorized. The same is true of gender, which only has two options for male and female. This process erases many people from the data across multiple axes. However, a solution to switching the data inputs from say self-identified um, instead of officer identified and broadening the categories may result in quote unquote less biased data or arguably free the data, however, it in, it, it in and of itself does not challenge the underlying power differentials of racism and policing. If anything, it only adds to the imbalance of a relationship of surveillance. So I've sat in on several presentations throughout this conference that have to do with ancestry and genetic sequencing. sequencing. Um, and so I highly, highly recommend this book if anyone does that kind of work. Um, and before you ask us for more data, especially as indigenous people who are often under underrepresented in that, do you know the history of genetic scientists' treatment of Native Americans' DNA? Do you know how these questions are outlined here, such as for whom, for, for and by whom are such categories, race, ethnicity, nation, family, tribe defined? How have continental level race categories come to matter? And why do they matter more than peoples that condition indigenous narratives, um, knowledges, and claims? We live in an imbalanced world, and Kim Tallbear summarizes in the intro of her book, some people's ideas and knowledge matter more than others. Genetic markers and populations named and ordered by scientists play key roles in the history that has come to matter for the nation and increasingly the world. She explains Indians were seen as doomed to vanish before the steam engine of westward expansion. Today, indigenous peoples are doomed to vanish through genetic admixture. The idea was then and is now that they should be studied before their kind is no more. And it is the means, not the ends that the science keeps its sights on. She also continues and says, of course, mixing is predicated on the notion of purity, the historical constitution of continental spaces and concomitant a grouping of humans into races is the macro frame of the reference for the human genome diversity researcher. Scientists who trace human migrations do not tell a story from the standpoint of those humans who were encountered. They tell a story from the standpoint of those who did the encountering. Those who named and ordered many thousands of people into undifferentiated masses of Native Americans, Africans, Asians, and Indo-Europeans. She identifies a, a kind of loop of circular reasoning, particularly that pure biogeographic bio origins must be assumed in order to constitute the data that supposedly reveals the same origins. Native American DNA as an object could not exist without and yet functions as a scientific data point to support the idea of once pure original populations. So in conclusion, there's a certain kind of distance here in the names researcher and subject. Some would say a necessary uh, objective distance, but I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a disembodied scientist. I'd rather be a good relative. I want to hold the stories of all the people I've met, never met, and never will meet with all the reverence and attunement that I'd hope that someone would hold mine. So, ahead. <laughs>
I mean, I think that's the point is just being able to analyze what the impacts of not being able to change that. So these are data limitations that we have, like these are all the only categories that we have with our particular data set. So I think step one is being able to really map out what are the effects of that. Um, and then also, you know, do you have relationships with the people who are directly impacted by that? Um, what would having and developing a relationship like that change just the way that we do science, whether it's that categorization? There's also something that um, in data feminism that's talked about um, in terms of counter data. So it's finding new or creating new data sets in order to kind of counter these narratives or add to. Um, and I think as our role as, you know, oftentimes as researchers and scientists, it's also to take a kind of a step back um, and to think about, you know, is this data that we should, you know, own, like ownership and data ownership is a really big um, component that is also factored into that. Um, there's some data sets where it's just like it's not our business, you know, to know this particular knowledge. It's supposed to be held by the people who have them. Um, so I know that's kind of like an app abstract answer, but I think it's just kind of, you know, pushing folks to look at um, just kind of the overall structure and push towards frameworks that, you know, are different than, you know, these are the categories that we have and we're confined by them. So I, I hope that helps. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking about your slide where you talked about the male scientific case, for which I'm probably like a prime candidate. Um, and so if I am unable to see the world objectively because of my background and my race and my sort of gender identity, um, and other people who have different backgrounds like that also see the world subjectively, do we have any hope for objective research in any ways? Or how do we wrestle with multiple viewpoints that see things in a different light? Uh, do we like combine them? Or like, is there objective truth right there? Yeah, I mean, I think the way that I've been grappling with this is just, you know, there's objectivity and subjectivity, which, you know, exists within a binary that often has a higher girl element, whereas subjective is, you know, seen as, you know, more valuable than subjective. And the more and more I think about it, I think of objectivity is anti-relational. So like that, because it has that hierarchical component. And it's also been historically weaponized against other viewpoints to say that they're not valued. So I really think you know, our best path forward is to let go of like just that idea that there is such a thing and to really, you know, what does it look like to embrace multiplicities um, and that, you know, in terms of also solutions, that means that, um, you know, solutions are going to be very location and time based um, and very specific. So um, that's what I would be pushing, you know, for folks is that, you know, that I think we'll be a lot freer if we let that go. So my question you is, you know, Awesome. Well, I think it's what we need to, yes. But it's better than like, oh, we can't let go of it or, you know, it's it's too dangerous too. And I think it's been dangerous not to. Um, I don't know if we have another question for another, or um, time for. One more question. I'm, I'm interested in this idea. And I'm curious what your perspective is on this, because certainly in terms of our interpersonal interaction, today we can understand them and having this relational understanding, letting them sort of speak their experiences and trying to engage on more meaningful levels rather than having free okay. um, When it comes, though, to more like national policy, when mm -hmm. we're sort of implementing things for an entire country, there's 300 plus million kind of individuals living here that all kind of have these different things. And it seems like, I don't know if objectivity is the right word, but there is by necessity, some distance because you can't be 
close to every single person's experience when trying to do these uh, broader decisions. And I'm curious if you have thoughts on sort of what the space is for, I guess, acknowledging that to sort of specifically meet one person's needs, you're kind of maybe ignoring or moving to the side on someone else's. Yeah, I mean, I think I would reframe that like a lot of these issues isn't necessarily one person's needs, it's communities, of people that get subsumed into these larger categories. Mm. Um, but, you know, in addition to that, I also think it's like incremental changes at more local levels. Um, so some things that are going on is in California, Cielo's um, part of the advocates for this. I think it's SB 435, I want to say, but it's... Um, to change how health data is collected, particularly for uh, Latino, Latinx, to include um, different indigenous nations. And they name like at least 10 that should be at minimum um, added and counted. And also include the language as well, um, because that language point is really important because that's, um, that's very deadly in those instances where you're in a hospital setting, you can't advocate for yourself in your language, also in court systems. Um, so I think that's an example of just, you know, changing things. The um, Urban Indian Health Institute in Seattle has a bunch of recommendations on how to change um, data collection practices for American Indian and Alaska Natives in particular. So I think a lot of it's also the power shift in terms of who, um, you know, owns and, you know, stipulates like how data should be collected should be the people that the data is being collected about. So I think that's probably one of the best shifts to make is, you know, thinking about who's collecting the data, who has the power to determine what the categories are, should be the people who are being impacted by it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such a great discussion already. We'll have more time later. Um, I do want to take a moment, I meant to do this earlier, to acknowledge that a couple of days ago, we had a federal holiday, um, Juneteenth, is a federal holiday to commemorate the emancipation of enslaved African Americans. And I think that's very with a session such as ours. Um, and then it is my absolute delight to introduce Dr. Miguel Marino. He is an associate professor in biostatistics in the Department of Family Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. He is co-director of the Primary Care Latino Equity Research Center. His research focus is on the development and implementation of statistical methodology to address complexity associated with the use of electronic health records to study health equity and changes in health policy among low-income disadvantaged populations seeking care in primary care clinics. Dr. Marino is statistical editor for JAMA Health Forum, co-chair of the NIH Community Engagement Alliance, needs assessment and evaluation workshop, work group, excuse me, and on the National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations for the Census Bureau. In 2022, Dr. Marino was elected as a member to the National Academy of Medicine. He holds a PhD in biostatistics from Harvard University and MS in biostatistics and BS in mathematics. Thank you. The Zoom's not working. The Zoom the is Zoom. not working. Did it log you off? The no, it's not because we're changing presentations. I think okay. you just need a screen share. Okay. Uh, thank you for letting me know. It looks like it's still recording. Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, it's an honor to be here and a pleasure. And thank you all for coming on the last day here. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about opportunities and challenges for disaggregation of race and ethnicity data. So it's a really nice sort of tie-in from the previous presentation. Um, and this is joint work uh, with my center co-director and thought partner, Dr. John Heinzman. Let's see how this works. Okay. So, so sort of why data disaggregation? So I'll begin with a couple of figures just to motivate the topic. So in the beginning of, pan of the pandemic, there was an urgent need to know which communities were negatively impacted by COVID-19. And the best we could do, given our, our current federal and state data collection procedures were figures like this one. Um, so here's a CDC uh, report that looks at age-adjusted COVID-19 associated uh, hosp uh, hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity from the beginning of the pandemic to about October 17. And so in terms of understanding health disparities, research 
and data collection often focus on these major demographic characteristics like race and ethnicity. Um, and what we typically see is that although the US is made up of a diverse racial and ethnic population, it is typically categorized into these five distinct groups. So Latinos, American Indian, Alaska Natives, non-Hispanic Black, um, Asian American, uh, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and white Americans. And so these definitions of race and ethnicity are a direct result of federal definitions determined by the OMB, um, the Office of Management and Budget. And so, so despite these categories, however, there, there does exist significant variation um, in histories and lived experience within each of these groups, all of which can potentially influence health outcomes and as well uh, have risk factors uh, uh, for poor health. Um, so for example, if you look at the bar on the left that aggregates Latinos, so, so Latinos make up about 16% of the population and among Latinos, three quarters self-identify as Mexican, Cuban, or Puerto Rican, which represent significantly different cultures and history. Um, for American Indian and Alaska Native populations in the US, there are 573 federally recognized nations which differ ethnically, culturally, linguistically, and who have members who live on and off the reservation, which can influence their access to healthcare. And among non-Hispanic Black population, um, that's somewhere around uh, 42 million of which more than 3 million are immigrants, mostly coming from Africa and the Caribbean. And we know that migrant status plays an important role in healthcare utilization and outcomes. And then when we look at Asian or Pacific Islander population, uh, they account for more than 17 million individuals in the US. Um, and among all refugees that arrived in the US between 2000 and uh, 2010, half of them were Asian or Pacific Islanders. And so we also know that coming to the US as a refugee has a vastly different experience uh, than those who voluntarily immigrated. Um, and then lastly, for non-Hispanic white uh, people, they represent about two thirds of the US population, but have the cultural diversity of three continents. And so this idea of data disaggregation um, is that by breaking out data by more granular key characteristics that could potentially lead um, to the design and application of culturally appropriate approaches to both medicine and public health. And this is just a collection of, uh, of organizations from the uh, American Medical Association to the Brookings Institute that really have called out for uh, ways and approaches to, to try to do this in a, in a very appropriate way. And so with this in mind, let me present a few more figures um, to motivate the work that I'll be presenting on the topic of data disaggregation. So this is a CDC figure, uh, again, that shows that the main five, uh, or in this case, four uh, racial ethnic groups and in particular looking at disparities in stroke deaths. And so what I wanna highlight here is the interesting finding that shows that Hispanic men and women here on the right seem to have the lowest rates of stroke deaths among all groups. So on the surface, it does look like Latinos are at lower risk for death from stroke than other groups. And this observation of a, of a relative mortality advantage is not strictly limited to just stroke outcomes. It has been borne out across a host of different health outcomes. Um, so much so that the epidemiological uh, finding has a name and it's called the Latino paradox. Um, and so simply put, the Latino paradox is this observation that relative to non-Latino whites, Latinos in the US have a lower socioeconomic status profile. So lower income, more under, underinsured, lower access to healthcare, all of that, but still also still have a uh, lower all-cause mortality rates from various diseases. And this runs counter to the well-known inverse association between socioeconomic status and poor health. And so there have been many hypotheses about why this paradox is observed, uh, but there's still a lot we don't know. And what we don't know could provide insights about what protective factors are important for addressing health inequities. Um, and this is an important area of current and future research as highlighted by the National Institute of Health, uh, Minority Health and Health Disparity Strategic okay. Plan. Um, and so in this report, they state that within the next five years, there should be approaches to differentiate the protective factor profiles of various immigrant groups. So in other words, there is a specific call out for data disaggregation. Um, and e even in the Affordable Care Act, there have been specific calls for that as well. So, so there's a lot of federal policy initiatives and, and a lot of agencies really trying to figure out how do we how, how do we differentiate these protective factors 
and how do we do this in a disaggregated, um, culturally appropriate way? Um, and this is because aggregating data to broad categories like these two bars on the right ignores significant variation that exists within those broad categories. And so while the previous figure showed a risk profile in aggregate among all Latinos, this figure portrays the variability of stroke deaths uh, and, and stroke death rates um, in Latin American countries. Um, and so this study finds that the burden of stroke differs drastically across Latino subgroups. So even among neighboring countries who may or may not speak the same language or who may have different histories and cultures. Um, and, and so why is this important? And, and we know this as well, that, that immigration and nativity status is believed to be a powerful uh, uh, determinant of health, possibly affecting multiple generations. Um, and this has important ramifications since this group isn't small. Um, the US Census Bureau estimates that about 14% of the US population are immigrants and that this population is going to increase over the next 50 years. And so just coming back to this idea of data disaggregation, this idea of breaking out data by more granular key characteristics such as immigration uh, status or country of birth really again could lead to, to uh, the design application of, of approaches for primary care and public health. And so the goal is to get more granular subgroup information because specific place of birth is an important determinant of health. And so ideally, we would like to have data sets that contain that information and all relevant demographics. So things like language preference, nativity, socioeconomic status, healthcare utilization, all of that together with objectively measured healthcare outcomes in order to really most completely study um, health disparities. And so when we think about uh, where does most common country of origin data come from? Um, so those typically come from surveys where participants get specifically asked about their background. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of the drawbacks of surveys is that they miss important healthcare um, utilization variables and are typically cross-sectional, really limiting our ability to do longit longitudinal research over many years. Um, and on the other hand, electronic health records have been shown to be a promising data source for health disparities uh, research as they collect objectively measured health outcomes and important covariates that can be linked um, to, uh, in, to important community level social determinants of health um, to be able to do multi-level research, which is another sort of call out from the NIMHD um, NIH agency. Um, the, the big limitation though is it's unclear if the electronic health records um, routinely collect country of origin uh, or nativity data, really limiting our ability to do um, this important subgroup uh, health disparities research. Um, so in addition to that, the other big question has always been, well, is the use of EHR universal to really do this at a large enough scale to, to, to uh, like we could do with surveys, right? So the nice thing about surveys is you can make these sort of population level surveys, draw out population level inference, and so, so is the EHR, are we, do we have sort of the, the capability to do this? And the answer is we're actually starting to build that infrastructure here in the United States. Um, so the Affordable Care Act of uh, uh, 2010 established PCORI. And one of the things that this legislative act did was to create a network of EHR networks to provide a national infrastructure for patient-centered research. And, and so PCORNet, which is this, this network of networks, uh, reaches more than 66 million populations, um, and it is using this network and it's specifically uh, within the OCHA network of community health centers that I, that I will now present some of the work we've been doing on Latino data disaggregation using EHRs. So shortly after the passing of the Affordable Care Act, we wanted to know at the local level, what was the impact of the ACA on reducing insurance disparities among low-income Oregonians? Um, so here we decided to disaggregate Latinos by their language preference, as this was readily available in the EHR, um, and among Latinos is a proxy for acculturation. And so there were two, two main takeaways. Um, so insurance disparities here were eliminated after Medicaid expansion. So all three groups, Latinos with Spanish preference, those with English preference, and the reference group of white patients had similar uninsured rates of 13% following the ACA. Um, and so interestingly, though, the group with the large insurance gains were those with Spanish preference. And when we're thinking about protective factors, we actually did qualitative interviews where we said, well, why is this? 
And what we found out is that in a lot of these Oregon CHCs, there were these uh, promotoras, so these sort of workers who like really helped uh, met or, or guide the Spanish uh, uh, preferring la Latinas and Latinos to, to seek uh, and fill out paperwork. So it really was these, these sort of these community uh, workers who really helped uh, drive this, this, this sort of improvement in insurance rate. Um, and so recently, we looked at influenza and pneumococcal vaccination uptake among older Latinos, also disaggregated by language. Um, and we found that compared to non-Latino white patients, um, Spanish preferring Hispanic patients were more likely to receive influenza and pneumococcal vaccination, vaccinations than non-Hispanic white patients. And older English preferring Hispanic patients were often less likely uh, than non-Hispanic white patients to receive these vaccinations. So when we're thinking about uh, creating vaccine initiatives, it looks like English preferring Hispanic patients may be at a higher risk of vaccine inequity. And so if you just look at the blue and the, and the, um, and the red uh, point estimates and the standard errors, so had we really aggregated and just done a simple Latino versus white, we would have observed likely a lack of disparity. And, and so by disaggregating, at least in this case by language, it really allows us to identify opportunities to improve uh, the vaccine uptakes in this population. And so while it is important to, to look at disaggregation by language, that approach is still a bit broad um, and it really could be furthered by disaggregation by country of birth to meet the strategic plan of NIMHD. And so given our interest in data disaggregation of Latino subgroups, we asked, well, does the EHR even have place of birth uh, that would allow us to start doing this work? And so we endeavored uh, in this, again, sort of multi-state large network of EHRs uh, uh, in community health centers, um, the extent to which country of birth is recorded in the EHR. And what we found was, was pretty surprising. So we found that hundreds of clinics across 22 states recorded at least one patient's country of birth. So it is embedded as a structured field in the EHR, and there was way, uh, uh, more collection than at least we had hypothesized. Um, and so furthermore, uh, in the same study using cardiovascular disease as a clinical test case, uh, we displayed the covariate adjusted prevalences of cardiovascular disease and risk factor diagnoses among the three major uh, ethnicity and TB groups. So, so U.S. born Latinos, non-U.S. born Latinos, and Latinos with no place of birth recorded in the, in the EHR. So then if you imagine then the typical analysis would just sort of shrink those three estimates into one, and they will just be one plot, one estimate. And in this scenario, maybe it doesn't look that bad, right? So what we see from this plot is that foreign born Latinos had a, a lower adjusted prevalence of obesity than other groups, but diagnosis prevalences of all other conditions were for the most part similar. Um, however, when this data is further disaggregated into specific country of birth, uh, there is increased variability in findings between countries, um, specifically in hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes. Um, so, for example, the prevalence of hyperlipidemia denoted here in the middle panel, uh, which is a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease, ranges from about 15% for Cubans to about 28% for Mexicans. Um, and a similar pattern is observed in obesity prevalence. And so the big, so, so while that was useful and it shows a sort of a, a really nice use case, uh, the big limitation of the prior study is that of the close to 1 million Latino patients in this network of community health centers, country of birth was only collected for about 14% of them. So there's still a lot of Latino patients that are being left out of further analyses. And so one of the goals of our center was to improve EHR-based approaches to study Latino disparities by developing and validating methods for using community level subgroup data. So the percent composition of the neighborhood where a person resides and a patient's surname to infer individual level Latino subgroup for the purposes of producing nuanced health equity research among all Latinos. And so in this, in this paper, uh, we used uh, machine learning methods, so specifically the super learner framework uh, to infer, and, and for the most part with good accuracy, uh, foreign born status and specific country of birth, though it was limited to Mexico, Guatemala, and Cuba due to sample size restrictions. And so all models here showed uh, um, uh, outstanding discrimination uh, between foreign-born status and specific country of birth. 
And, and, and I do want to note that although prediction model uh, algorithms are imperfect um, and cannot replace self-reported nativity and country of origin, okay. our modeling, we hope, is the beginning of an important dialogue that can be used um, in health services, primary care, and public health uh, to better understand how Latino subgroups utilize healthcare resources um, and experience health outcomes in the absence of patient-reported data. And so while data disaggregation may show promise for health equity research, there's still several challenges that should be acknowledged. Um, so first is, is disaggregation could result in small sample sizes, uh, risking uh, generalizability and creating uh, data privacy concerns. So, so as statisticians, we know that, that our approaches are only as good as our data. And when the sample size is small, we really have a hard time knowing what to do with it. Uh, and it, would, would you analyze it? Do you report it? Do you exclude it? Right, so these are all questions, and, and then you have to think about, well, does this sort of generalize uh, to other settings? And so, so even more problematic than those questions is, is the potential for creating small enough groups that those within the groups could be uh, easily identified. And so in the past, both far and near, um, disaggregation has been used as a target uh, to, to harm specific racial and ethnic groups. So an example, as an example here, the, the Mexican race uh, was an option that was introduced in the 1930s, uh, in the 1930 census, aimed to monitor and segregate the growing immigrant group um, at the time. And so over the years, however, the sort of uh, uh, civil rights legislation has worked to establish protections, um, uh, but racial profiling remains salient. It's a salient issue still, even as recent as the sort of the 9-11 uh, events of 9-11 with the ongoing surveillance of uh, Arab Americans. Oh. Um, so additionally, sort of opponents of data disaggregation have amplified their voices, uh, suggesting that disaggregation could lead to the lowering of political power of the aggregate group um, and could potentially uh, pit, uh, pit subgroups against each other, right? So by disaggregating, you may be sort of make, sort of uh, breaking down a big, large group with, with good political power and pitting them against each other. And so as statisticians, I think one important thing to consider is sort of how do you find ways to re-aggregate back to federal categories uh, that may will always be an important consideration um, so that we ensure that we don't disempower minority groups. Um, and then lastly, uh, data segregation is very hard work and it's very dynamic and because of the lack of consensus, consensus or, uh, in terminology over time. Um, uh, so for example, uh, this figure shows how the federal government has disaggregated or aggregated uh, race and ethnicity over the last 60 years. So on the bottom, you will see the general categories that are commonly used today, but it always hasn't been this way. Um, so while not universally followed, one can see the relatively constant change. And this has always sort of been a moving target in, in government data collection of race and ethnicity. Um, and this is simply not a taxonomy problem. It, it is layered with power dynamics. So early in our history, uh, those in power impose their categorizations and then use those classifications to harm them. Um, and I bring up this history because I believe it, this really highlights the challenges of, of data disaggregation. Um, this is not a, a morally neutral scientific exercise, uh, but, but a higher stakes challenge that has not been dealt with in the past. It hasn't been dealt with well in the past. So, so one can't disentangle the power dynamics and racism from this. Um, it is a challenge because of its history and it's something to keep in mind and address as we move forward with proposals and innovations. And so now let's talk a little bit about opportunities. So, so I've sort of shown in prior slides, a lot of the reasons why we have these broad categories is because of the state um, and local government agencies taking cues from how the federal government approaches this topic. Um, and so there have been many opportunities for us to lead from the ground up in collaboration with, with organizations to really show them uh, when it is important to collect this data. And this then could inform uh, how cities uh, collect this, which could cue states, and then perhaps provide approaches for federal agencies. Um, so this kind of grassroots approach is, is one of the reasons why the federal government um, is considering for the first time in 25 years, uh, changes to the races and ethnicity questions in the census and other federal uh, data sources. So, so uh, stay tuned. I think they're 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 they opened up for some public feedback. Now they're uh, reviewing the feedback, and we'll you know we'll make some determinations in the upcoming year. Um, 
it is also uh, my opinion that that thoughtful data desegregation should include uh, local community organizations to receive important feedback, um, and then together transparently co-developed approaches for data disaggregation. Um, so as a statistician faculty member who primarily focuses on writing NIH grants to do scientific research, um, I really didn't know how to begin engaging uh, the community in this work. Um, and so, 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 however, you know, I, I really thought this this was a conviction I had that that really we we have to start figuring out how to do this with the community and how to do it well. Um, and so I was I, I sought out um, and was fortunate enough to to receive grant to support uh, bringing together several Oregon Latino community organizations and local and national thought leaders um, to start this process. And so a couple months ago, uh, we kicked off our inaugural Latino Summit, which uh, discussed several topics, uh, including the Latino paradox. But this really was uh, sort of the, the, the start of, of uh, a conversation and a collaboration about how do we do Latino data disaggregation in, in a way that is community oriented and more than anything, ethically and responsibly and have utility to really inform um, those subgroups in, in need of support. Um, so at the summit, we learned so much from, from the community um, and we hope to continue to build uh, those bridges to inform our work in Latino data disaggregation. Um, and then lastly, uh, this work needs uh, uh, to be regularly updating labels based on changes in, in definitions and community preferences and in shifts in the population. Um, I also think it also requires policies to train and educate the data collectors, the managers, the analysts to avoid repeating past harms for communities. Um, and just in general, this is not a one-time engagement, but a career-long commitment. Um, and so while I focused on race and ethnicity, and specifically among Latino, uh, uh, the Latino group, I do want to mention that race and ethnicity are not the only dimensions of identity that matter to health outcomes. So other variables like sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, uh, we talked about country of origin, immigration status, ancestry, skin tone, and many, many, many more have consequences for health that could also benefit from thoughtful disaggregation of their data. Um, and so to conclude, so improving how we collect, investigate, and respond to disaggregated data on ethnicity is central to the pursuit of health equity. Um, there is a need for investing in approaches that address small end populations and small sample sizes. So sort of as, as the previous presenters uh, spoke, right? How do, we, how do we develop small sample size approaches, right? Um, I know big data is important and, and more power to that too, but uh, also uh, thinking about the need for, for sort of small end uh, uh, methods. I do want to reiterate that, uh, that, that self-reported nativity is the gold standard. That is exactly what we should be collecting. But in lieu of this information, uh, we need approaches for really better understanding how Latino subgroups utilize healthcare resources and experience health call outcomes. And so uh, we do need approaches for that until it, it becomes a standard to, to, to collect this more granular information. Um, and then health equity research benefits from being interdisciplinary and diverse. So how can we build stronger connections? So sort of how do you balance these small NIH budgets to build a bigger tent um, and bring in a host of different people to the table? I think that's a challenge and, and something we're sort of trying to figure out as well. Um, so uh, all this work is through the hard work of our center, uh, the people who work there, um, and just want to acknowledge them as well. And would also like to acknowledge our sponsors who uh, have provided funding for this work. Um, and uh, at this time, I can take some questions. The idea that folks may not have as much information about them and they might be moving between maybe different publishings. So, what have you thought about that in your research data and trying to you know, identify? Great question. And this is something that is that I've put a lot of thought into. Um, and my, my answer is it actually, so, 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 like. When I think of EHRs, I don't think of EHRs, I think of context. Where are those EHRs situated in? 
In my particular area of research in community health centers, um, uh, so these are these these are community primary care clinics that serve low income underinsured uh, patients. So these these patients typically don't have a lot of resources to go elsewhere, and so they really do seek care in these clinics. And so to to, to follow up that point, we were interested in understanding well well how often do they come? Like what's the sort of attrition rate? And so we actually did, what we did is we, we linked EHRs with uh, Medicaid claims data because Medicaid claims data, if, if someone leaves the clinic to go somewhere else, then, then it could get captured in the claims, but it may be missing in the EHR. And what we found that over a three-year period, the, the attrition rate was, was pretty low. And, and so it sounds like, and, and more work needs to be done, but it sounds like, like uh, these patients, just because of, of, of their situations, are more likely to just stay within the network and and these and these community health centers are linked. And so, if a patient leaves from one clinic to another within the OCHA network of sort of a thousand clinics, we they are still followed, and we can still sort of see where they they are getting care. So, but in a different setting, I think that would be a much more hard. It's a, it would be a different question and a different concern. It's still a concern, but I think that's where I think the context matters. Where it is that these EHRs are being being situated. We're talking about a hospital. That's even part. That's even worse, right? So then, so then, so then, when you think of EHRs, think of where are they? Where where the, where are they located? So I know you're focusing. Or like, would that apply also to healthcare? Yeah, good question. So, so one of the things that um, the census is considering is 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 creating a new category for uh, Middle Eastern North Africans. So, so they're they're actually thinking of creating a new checkbox that would be MENA, sort of the. Um, so that's one thing that the government is doing, um, and and so I think, and this is where uh, this is where. I, I do see data segregation being important in, in, in that population that you mentioned. And it is something that I think, I think someone with intimate knowledge of, of that population who has connections, who has a uh, rooted uh, interest in that population, I think, I think we do need that. And I think, but what, what we need is sort of thoughtful people who are, who are doing it right, right? So like, I, I, I think like, um, Sort of, we're all we're all here, with sort of different backgrounds, and I think we can all contribute in those ways. I think generally the framework of sort of what I did here, I think, could apply uh, to to Arab Americans, and so so generally I would sort of support that. But I think that would require um, having leads who who are uh, really intimate with with the population, who uh, sort of have similar sort of um, ethics about doing it well. Screen 